Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to this uh, marvellous celebration, Purumpa. And I uh, acknowledge the Garana traditional owners and their elders past and present and give my thanks to Asha and especially Mugi yesterday. So uh, I'm here with a brief. Uh, I was asked by Francesca to talk about the Aboriginal Arts Board established in 1973 and it is a moment of celebration and I, I want you to join me in celebrating the wonderful people who uh, commenced the, uh, as uh, board members of the Aboriginal Arts Board in 1973. Now I'm going to have to do some juggling. So uh, this is a photograph of the first chairman, Dick Ruffsey, with his old mate Percy Trezice there on the left. He worked with him for many years up in Cape York. And in the middle is um, Gough Whitlam. So uh, most of you uh, were born before uh, this time and you won't uh, have an understanding of how utterly revolutionary this was. Uh, that's a painting by Dick Ruffsey. I used to read his children's books to my uh, daughter. Um, and this is about his uh, birthplace and his birth. Um, uh, his name was Gubala Thardin, Thaldin, and uh, he was from Mornington Island. And he travelled all through Cape York and the Gulf documenting landscapes like this and events like this with Percy Trezice and especially the, the rock art. Um, most people have forgotten him now, but he was quite the character and quite the arts leader uh, at this time and took his job very seriously. Um, so I'll just uh, go back to that painting. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to have to flip backwards and forwards between this. So this is... Uh, Gough Whitlam's statement as Prime Minister. So let me find it on my computer so that I can read it to you. Um, so remember, this is 1973. Um, and the language is very different from the language that we use today. Press statement number 83, 3rd of May 1973, Aboriginal Arts Board. Aboriginals have been given full responsibility for developing their own programs in the arts under a new government policy to revitalise cultural activities through the Australian Council for the Arts. Artists and craftsmen from remote centres, towns and cities have been appointed to the Aboriginal Arts Board of the Council. The board's chairman, as previously announced, is the Aboriginal author and artist, Dr Dick Ruffsey of Mornington Island. The members of the board are Mr Raphael Apuatimi, um, skilled traditional dancer from Bathurst Island, actively involved in dance groups in the Northern Territory. He also wrote a wonderful book uh, and he recorded songs which he composed. Uh, I may be able to find one for you. Mr Albert Barunga and I, 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 I you know, trigger warning, um, most of these people have passed away and there are descendants of these people in the room. I believe the granddaughters of Mr Apu Atimi are here, at least I said hello to them yesterday. Um, Mr Albert Barunga, leading Aboriginal councillor at Moanjum in Western Australia and member of many Aboriginal communities. And for those of you who have been there recently, you'll know there's a new beautiful Moanjum Arts Centre. Mr Harold Blair, noted tenor, engaged as a music teacher with the Victorian Education Department, sponsor of the Harold Blair Holiday Scheme for Aboriginal children from outback areas. Mr Ken Colbung, coordinator of Aboriginal Cultural Enterprise Society Perth uh, and uh, a, very much a patron of the arts and ceremony. Um, Mrs Kitty Dick, a leader in ceremonial life among the women of Weeper in North Queensland. Mr Chicka Dixon, waterside worker of Sydney and manager of Aboriginal pop groups performing in clubs. 
central figure in... I think Black Magic was one of them, right? Yeah, Black Magic. For those of you who were in Redfern back then, that was the, the main music. Yeah. Um, central figure in black political movement, leader of Aboriginal delegation to China. Um, Mrs Ruby Hammond from here in Adelaide, foundation member of the South Australian Aboriginal Art Cooperative and actively engaged in community de development projects. Mr Tim Lura Jabaljari, outstanding traditional artist of the Pinterby Walpuri School at Papunya in Central Australia. Mr Eric Kuila, authority on ceremonial life at Arakoon in Queensland. Guide to anthropologists Ursula McConnell and Tom Donald Thompson. Mr Albert Lennon, a leading member of the Pijinjara Group of Northwest South Australia. Mr Mick Miller, school teacher of Cairns, member of the Association for Cultural Education of Children of the Peninsula. Um, has great knowledge of North Queensland where he's well known and of course he founded the North Queensland Land Council. Mr Wanjuk Marika, tribal leader at Yurikala in Arnhem Land, known for his deep understanding of traditional life and later he became the um, chair of the Aboriginal Arts Board. Mrs Vice Stanton from Darwin, um, Kungarakan woman, part Aboriginal, this remember, language of the day, deeply involved in giving encouragement in arts and crafts activities to Northern Territory Aboriginal women, Vice President of the Northern Territory Aboriginal Development Foundation. Mrs. Ter Mr. Terence Witters, Armadale Teachers College, involved in a country program for the revival of interest in traditions, trainee filmmaker. Um, and so uh, on that day then, this board was appointed and the uh, statement goes on to say that, uh, well, in addition to sponsoring the arts, music and dance, the board will study a form of quality control and a system of orderly marketing for arts and crafts. Remember, there had been no such thing previously. Uh, there had been little mission shops on missions and settlements um, and a few dodgy shops such as the Queensland government shop on George Street in Brisbane, which I later take pride in saying I shut down. Um, an intensive program is underway for Aboriginal theatre in urban communities. Support will be offered to extend this to the country where increasing numbers of Aboriginals are becoming interested in theatre as a form of expression. Sponsorship will be available also to Aboriginal authors and filmmakers. Remember, this is an absolute first in Australian history. Subsidies will be provided for publications so that Aboriginals can express to the wider community something of the richness of their culture. The new board will sponsor the first national seminar on Aboriginal arts to be held in Australia. This is planned from 21 to 25 May at the Australian National University in Canberra. About 200 people have been invited. They will be predominantly Aboriginals. The recommendations of the seminar will largely influence the board in its future policy planning for the stimulation and revitalisation of Aboriginal arts throughout the country. Now, I wanted to, if I have the time, this is uh, an old vinyl record of Tiwi music. And if I can make this work, I want to play you one song um, composed and sung by Mr Apu of Timi. I can, I can, I haven't got it on the, uh, I'm just going to, would you on. like me to put this on here and then you can put that next hang on, to the hang microphone? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Just get through this rubbish. It's the ads. More ads. I've, I, I've got YouTube here, so here we go. Oh. 
hold it. It's okay. Just let me hold it. I have to. Just let me do it, okay? I, I like teach every phone day. Phone? I go through this nonsense every day. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Can you hear that? So I probably don't have time to play the songs, but he composed Train Song and Boat Song. And, and you, can, you can hear them on YouTube. So just look up this uh, little vinyl on YouTube and uh, you will find uh, the uh, soundtrack and listen to Train Song and Boat Song. They're really quite extraordinary. Um, so. These were composed around the time that people saw their first train. Um, but of course, they'd been working on the boats and so they composed songs about everyday life and you know life on the boats. Uh, so these were people who were tremendously active in maintaining culture against the odds back then. Um, and... Uh, We're lucky to have uh, all of this available to us as a kind of history. Unfortunately, no history has ever been written. So I, I think the Aboriginal Arts Board should write this history up. And so what I'm giving you today is merely a potted history. Um, but let's just have a look at the, the context. For those of you who were in Sydney at the time, um, you might remember the um, New South Wales Art Gallery had all of the Aboriginal art in a basement gallery called the Primitive Art Gallery. And it was down there with the New Guinean art. And that's where it remained for many years until the New South Wales Art Gallery lifted its game. And that was many years later. But there'd never been an, an Arts Council of Australia until Whitlam set it up on the 26th of January, 1973. Um, and uh, it, he appointed an interim Arts Council and uh, established it with boards, advisory boards and councils, um, the Commonwealth Art Advisory Board, the Commonwealth Literary Fund, the Film and Television School and Advisory Board for Commonwealth Composers. Um, so remember, nothing like this had ever existed before. Um, so, sorry, you were all born too late. The revolution already happened. <laughs> um, so he uh, legislated the June uh, the Australia Council Act in 1975 on June 30th. Um, gave it a funding increase in each of its three budgets. Um, so it doesn't seem like much now, but it was a lot of money back then, 14 million in the 1973-74 budget. And it was increased by a further 50% in the 74-75 budget. Uh, uh, and uh, he, he, he had been, of course, you know, there were some great people around at the time, like dear old Nugget Coombs, who'd been the um, Reserve Bank Governor and advised eight Prime Ministers. He gave advice to Whitlam and, of course, they set up um, Opera Australia um, and many other cultural institutions which had never existed. So this was the Cultural Revolution. Um, they, Menzies had uh, taken a few hesitant steps to create the National Gallery of Australia. But it was uh, the Whitlam government that signed the contract for the construction of the gallery in April 73. And later that year, an interim gallery council was appointed by the government 
and Whitlam created the Art Acquisitions Committee and the collections of work for the gallery began. Many, well, those of you who are of my age will remember the Blue Poles scandal. Um, and, uh, you know, the gallery director had gone out and bought Blue Poles, uh, and as you did back then with a suitcase of cash. Um, and I think he paid $2 million for it. He carried the suitcase of cash on a plane. Um, and this was an enormous scandal in Australian society because nobody had ever seen a painting like this. <coughs> Hilarious. I don't know what it's worth now, but it must be worth about 200 million at least, right? <laughs> um, and Whitlam also saw the production of local film and television as an important part of the expression of a mature, independent Australian cultural identity. Um, and so he provided significant support to the Australian film and television industries. Um, provided increased support for local actors, filmmakers and producers by increasing the minimum Australian content requirements for commercial television networks. The ABC also conformed to these minimum content requirements and was given a major boost in government funding to assist in the production of local television content. Um, and the Film Commission, which was est he established also, uh, began making substantial grants to that end. Um, and so you might remember this was called, you know, the new uh, film, the new film um, movement in Australia. Um, and there was a flood of uh, incredible films such as Picnic at Hanging Rock, Gallipoli and The Last Wave. Um, and these were all produced with funding from the New Australian Film Commission. So this is all just to give you some context. Uh, there were uh, also training and education opportunities with the establishment of the Australian Film and Television School on August 31, 1973. And Whitlam himself officially opened the school just two years later and paid tribute to John Gorton for conceiving the idea for the institution. Um, Whitlam also supported music by introducing minimum Australian music content for commercial radio stations. 10% of music broadcast by commercial stations was to be the work of Australian musicians. Um, they, his government established 2JJ, now known as Triple J, as a station specifically designed to support Australian music and connect with young Australians. It began broadcasting Am I on the right screen? Yeah, sorry. Um, it began broadcasting on January 19, 1975. Um, and he also introduced FM radio in 1974, allowing improved sound quality and the licensing of more radio stations. Multicultural radio services such as 2EA Sydney and 3EA in Melbourne were established and licenses were issued to community radio stations for the first time. Um, this is uh, the list of board members of the Australia Council and I've read them out. Um, here are some lovely photos of Dick Ruffsey as a young man. He was a painter and I've shown you the painting of his birthplace before. Um, and here's a lovely photo of him with, now we don't know who the lady on the left is but you can see Xavier's trying to touch, him up, touch her up there. Um, Xavier Herbert. Uh, you can't see it. Sorry. Okay, there's uh, Gubel Thaldin and his birthplace painting. And this is uh, a photograph of Xavier Herbert touching up a young woman there, whose name we don't know. Xavier, of course, wrote Poor Fellow, My Country and Carpentaria. Um, he had been the superintendent of the old native compound or compound for half castes in Darwin um, and uh, he befriended uh, the McGuinness family and the, the half caste that he refers to in, um, in, in Poor Fellow My Country is Joe McGuinness's uncle I believe um, and then seated is uh, Than Coopy, the great 
Potter from Cape York. You'll see her work out the front of the National Gallery still today. Then Percy Josiah sitting next to her and Dick Ruffsey and his paintings behind on the wall. So this must be at Percy's old house in, um, in Laura um, where he lived and ran the old pub until it burnt down in the 90s. Um, and this is more of uh, Whitlam's statement where he's handing over power to Aboriginal people to establish an arts industry. I wanted to share those documents with you because I think, you know, this is really the beginning of uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts movement that we know today. These are the people who made it happen. And so we honour them. And I have another amazing document. So I let people know what I was looking for. Now I won't be able to put these on the screen because I, I wouldn't have been able to send the, uh, the, the PowerPoint, but I'm just going to read a little bit of this from, from, from this document. This is the national seminar that, uh, that Whitlam announced would, would happen. Now the problem is it's uh, a faded old uh, typescript from an archive. So I'm gonna have to do my best here. Um, resolutions carried in the plenary meetings of the National Seminar on Aboriginal Arts held in Canberra from 21st of May to the 25th of May 1973 under the sponsorship of the Aboriginal Arts Board of the Australia Council for the Arts. The Commonwealth Government is requested to vest full control and funding of all Aboriginal community and or regional art and craft cooperatives in the Aboriginal Arts Board, if necessary, by providing enabling legislation. So remember I said that the outlets for Aboriginal art were these little mission shops. Um, and I'll just I'll tell you a story about the one I shut down. Um, it was a government shop in, in Brisbane. Um, and what they'd been doing for years was paying um, Aboriginal people on the reserves, uh, such as Hopevale, uh, reserve in Cape York um, to uh, take the bark off trees and cut the bark up into small uh, pieces and ship the bark down to Brisbane. And of course, you'll remember that people were still under the act at that time. People had virtually no rights. Everyone was under the control of the, the superintendent, uh, which was a new name for the protector, the native protector. Um, and the, the, the reserves were pretty much, you know, in the worst cases run like military compounds, military prisons such as Palm Island. And um, there were also missions such as Arakoon, Mornington Island and such places. And the government had ceded management rights for a small fee to uh, missionary societies and the missionaries such as at Arakoon under Reverend Mackenzie would flog the locals. And maybe you've seen some of the documentaries of the children sweeping his yard with their fingers. So these were very cruel times. So I ended up working in the Queensland government when Goff, Goff, Wayne Goss came into power. The late Wayne Goss uh, became the premier. And uh, I, I had a look at the department that I was uh, the deputy of and part of it was this Aboriginal art shop on George Street with these pieces of bark stacked up out the back. And I, it, I discovered what was happening to them. There was a man paid, a white man paid to run the shop. He was importing carvings from the Solomons and put them in the front window. And then he would ship the squares of bark out to all the reserves and missions where Aboriginal people were given photocopies from pages from art books from the Northern Territory to copy the paintings onto these little squares to sell as souvenirs and he'd flog them off in the shop. So this was plainly fraudulent and a government was doing it. So I, I shut the shop down and I, I put a, a be safe display in the window with condoms and such because it was in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. Um, I was reported to every <laughs> authority in Queensland. Um, and um, 
I, ex I went up to see the Director General when I was called up to her office and I explained what I was doing and gave her a legal opinion. Uh, well, she backed right off and uh, I got um, Judy Wilson. Judy? The artist from Judy Watson. Watson. Judy Watson. Judy Watson from the, from the Gulf Country in to decorate the shop with paintings from country, um, just drove them insane. Um, I got Aboriginal people working in the shop, got rid of all of the nonsense and started bringing in real Aboriginal art and, and you know, Aboriginal souvenir products made by Aboriginal people. Um, so that was the kind of thing that was happening at the time. There, there was fraud, fraudulent behaviour in the market was typical um, and in fact, um, Wanjak Marika, you know, travelling from his community for the first time to Sydney for the meetings, found tea towels with his sacred designs on them. So this is when Abri Aboriginal people became alert to the fact that their most sacred designs were being copied uh, by white companies, white-owned companies, um, to make tea towels and such. And so you can then understand why they would want this, you know, control uh, of, of the entire industry and a marketing cooperative. They wanted full control. And they wanted an Aboriginal Arts Board set up in each state, um, a central authority to market arts from all centres at wholesale and retail rates. And, you know, you really should have invited Faye Nelson to give this lecture because she's still going well and she played a very large role in all of this. Um, the Aboriginal Arts Board shall sell goods only through its wholesale agencies and to authorised retailers who are informed on Aboriginal culture and conform to the high standards of quality and display laid down by the board. Art and craft cooperatives should be provided with non-repayable setting up grants to provide for an appropriate craft building, a truck for gathering material, working capital to purchase materials and equipment and money to purchase artefacts until sales revenue is established and any other essential requirement for setting up the industry. So now you know how these Aboriginal art cooperatives that are now quite famous around the country were established. It was from this resolution of this seminar. Um, and these are called the major organisations in the uh, Aboriginal, you know, the Australia Council funding program now. Um, and they really are the backbone of the Aboriginal arts industry today. Um, and it goes on, they wanted totally, total control um, and they wanted training um, in leadership and management at top level through the Australian Institute of Management, universities, schools of business administration and with the cooperation of senior businessmen. Well, in large part, you can see that their dream did not eventuate. Um, in some respects, the Aboriginal art cooperatives, it did, but uh, getting control of the market did, just didn't ever happen and we're still grappling with the same issues. Uh, there are about 50 resolutions. So let me just see if I can find some more of the really important ones. Uh, I'll just read the headlines. Employment in crafts to be Aboriginal dominated. <coughs> well, you know, in M Victoria, if I go to the market, the Queen Victoria markets, there are still shops there selling didgeridoos and, you know, all sorts of things made in China or Bali. <coughs> and this is happening throughout the country, of course. So we still haven't dealt with that problem adequately. There's still no enabling legislation to prevent it. Trade preference to Aboriginal enterprises. The Department of Trade and Industry and other government departments, when calling tenders for the supply of Aboriginal arts and crafts, should give preference in placing orders to Aboriginal manufacturers or distributors. Now, it happens to a small extent through procurement, but that one hasn't been achieved. The Prime Minister's Department in future should be asked to place orders with Aboriginal manufacturers or distributors 
for the supply of Aboriginal art and craft products for world expositions and other purposes. Well, it does happen, but it's a bit random. Um, it's not as was intended by the people who attended this seminar. Import restrictions on facsimiles still hasn't occurred. Patents and copyrights. Now, this is particularly important and, you know, your sister should have a look at this document. This is what they call for. This seminar recommends that the Aboriginal Arts Board should initiate procedures whereby each tribal body has a patent and or copyright on its own particular designs and work. Any designs which refer to Aboriginal Australians should be patented in the name of the Aboriginal Arts Board and their use by non-Aboriginals strictly controlled by the Aboriginal Arts Board. Um, Wanjuk Marika and Tommy Gugulpa or any other artists from Western Arnhem Land should be enabled to visit Queensland Aboriginal Creations, Brisbane. That's the place I told you about. In order to gather evidence with respect to the illegitimate copying of traditional sacred painted designs and of other traditional objects belonging to Aboriginal groups or individuals in order that copyright for these designs can be established to prevent reproductions without necessary permissions being obtained. Well, I didn't shot shut down that little shop of horrors until 1992. So, you know, 21 years later after they made that call when I was in a position to do so. It's one of the first things I did um, after repatriating all the human remains in the basement. Uh, the matter of retribution to Wanjak Marika and traditional artists whose designs have been copied and sold in this manner should be explored and immediate action taken to establish a procedure whereby fin financial compensation can be obtained from the offending parties. That has never occurred. Still to this day, nobody gets compensation because the first step, the legal recognition of the cultural property and ownership of the works has not been undertaken by legislation. A legal injunction should be sought immediately restraining Queensland Aboriginal creations and similar organisations from copying for sale any Aboriginal designs. So I'd like to urge uh, the Australia Council to go back to this marvellous document and uh, start acting now, 50 years later, on the resolutions. Seal of authority. The Commonwealth Government and any other relevant authority should declare void all registration of patents and or copyrights on Aboriginal designs by non-Aboriginal persons. You know, remember the Free the Flag campaign, which only ended last year. And there were three non-Indigenous companies licensed to control use of the flag and to receive commercial payments for it, which thereby prevented all of our community organisations and sporting clubs from using the Aboriginal flag on uniforms and, you know, products. The Commonwealth had to pay, well, we don't know what it was in the end, but it was a minimum of $30 million to buy out all those licences that the artists had given to those companies. And so the flag is now Commonwealth property um, until people do something about it like establish a trust for the Aboriginal ownership of the flag under trust for all the nations. The Aboriginal Arts Board should produce a seal that can be distributed to Aboriginal manufacturers to affix to their products. This seal will indicate that the article is made by an Aboriginal Australian. Now the Arts Board did try to do this back in uh, the 90s. And I remember Chris Bonney, I'm sorry, he passed away. A uh, wonderful man, um, went around the country and uh, campaigned for uh, a, a copyright mark for Aboriginal art. And it was actually opposed by Aboriginal artists, some Aboriginal artists. And so it didn't ever occur. Well, we have to go back to that. It's more than ever urgent that we have this copyright mark um, and the, you know, the legislation under, underpinning it. Teaching in schools, and all of us should follow up on that. 
uh, I'll skip to reintroduction and preservation of arts. Now that's happening all over the country as well. Um, exhibitions of Aboriginal arts, sales tax on Aboriginal artefacts. The Commonwealth Government should be asked to remove immediately sales tax from Aboriginal craft products. Visual, well, if they continue doing it, they should return the tax to the cooperatives, don't you think? Um, visual arts scholarships, desecration of sacred sites. Remember, there was no protection of sacred sites back then. This goes into quite a bit of detail, which I won't cover now. But of course, what were the paintings of? Of course, they were paintings in many cases of sacred sites um, and people wanted them protected. And this was when the mining industry ran amok and destroyed sites uh, without any controls whatsoever. And, you know, they wanted simple things like fencing of sites. That's the last part of that resolution. Uh, craft activity in Northwest South Australia. Statement by Aboriginal elders. So I'll read you this. We all agree we are Aboriginals. We, the tribal elders, want to inform the federal government that all people who have been known in the past as mixed blood or part Aboriginals are from here on fully recognised by us as Aboriginal people. We agree that we tribal elders should teach our culture, that young Aboriginal people come and learn culture in North Australia. The tribal elders accept all mixed bloods in this. We request that the federal, and remember, this is at the end of the assimilation program. Wiltham himself put an end to the assimilation program. And so here were the so-called full bloods responding at last in this new era of freedom to the, you know, uh, the old cattle breeding brands that they gave us, full blood, three quarter cast, half cast, quarter cast, octoroon, etc., which they wrote on the papers. Uh, and, and, and there's a very clear call from the elders for that to end, and they wanted to lead that. We request that the federal government be advised by the Aboriginal Arts Board that legislation be enacted pr to protect all areas of Aboriginal culture Australia-wide, especially as it applies to areas of copyright and protection of Aboriginal culture. That socio-cultural Aboriginal institutes, colleges be established in the different regional tribal areas of Australia to continue our culture by training Aboriginal artists and dancers. These should be schools of higher learning. And then only one was ever set up at that time, and that was the Bachelor College in the Northern Territory. Later, of course, but you know, uh, as an initiative of the dancers themselves, what we now call the National Aboriginal Islander um, School of uh, Dance Association, um, and then later Bangara. Um, but we don't uh, have the colleges that they wanted, and we should have. The Aboriginal Theatre Foundation, Darwin. This seminar recommends that the Aboriginal Arts Board appoint a subcommittee to investigate the Aboriginal Theatre Foundation's constitution and activities over the past three years with a view to proposing a scheme which would better serve the needs of Aboriginal theatre on a planned basis. So you can see they covered everything. Uh, I think I'm out of time, is that right? Uh, so I wanted to share uh, the initiation of the Aboriginal Arts Board, and, and there was just, can I have two more minutes? There was one more thing I wanted to tell you about. Um, amazingly, they, there was an effort uh, to enact some of those resolutions. And so the Aboriginal Arts Agency was established. It no longer really exists except in name, and it its archives. So uh, there's one article published on uh, its activities and archives, referring in, uh, indeed to that national seminar. Um, and one of the key points was the rights of Indigenous artists to receive equitable pay and copyright protection. And so that's what the Aboriginal Artists Agency did for years, both with its closure, because the people who ran it grew old and nobody really wanted to do the hard yards, now individual artists have to go to um, you know, the copyright agency and APRA to get copyright protection for their works. And it's you know, up to the individual. Um, whereas 
under the Aboriginal Artists Agency, they were very proactive uh, in, in making sure that Indigenous artists got uh, you know, equitable pay and copyright protection and royalties for their original works. And uh, the Aboriginal Artists Agency had many members and uh, organised festivals and so on. Uh, so I want to acknowledge the, um, the Aboriginal Artists Agency, Anthony Wallace, um, and the wonderful elders who, who worked with him, um, such as, uh, and he's passed away too. Um, can't remember his name. I'm gonna find it. I won't go down that rabbit hole. Wonderful artist and elder. Um, he doesn't get mentioned much these days, but he was the ritual leader who convened the festivals in North Australia, where the Aboriginal Artists Agency brought people together for ceremonies and to keep all of that design and dance and music alive. Um, when uh, the Aboriginal Arts Board and the Australia Council get around to writing this history, I will have remembered the name, but so you're going to do that very soon, right? <laughs> um, thank you.